Welcome to Go Get Great, the podcast for aspiring entrepreneurs and ambitious small business owners. I'm your host, Brittany, owner of Brittany Miller Socials and mother of three. Go Get Great is all about helping you make life and business work together. You'll learn about the fumbles that helped get me and my guests to where we are today so you don't have to make them. So come join the journey with Go Get Great. Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be joined by guest Diana Schroeder today. She is an MA, EFO, a national speaker, writer, and podcast host focused on helping leaders understand and appreciate the value of self-care, such an important topic. And she's also been a leader in a very male-dominated fire service industry for 24 years. So she really knows about the the practices of self-care that enables leaders to find their authentic self, have a work-life balance and increase productivity because authentic leaders create healthy, inclusive, and diverse work cultures of belonging, which is super important. She has a master's degree in organizational leadership and Diane combines her wisdom with a data to guide leaders down the self-care path. So she shares her knowledge with her community through email and her weekly podcast, The Fire Inside Her. And Diane also speaks all across the country as a TED Talk speaker and is currently working on a book about leadership. So I am just so excited to be chatting with her today to learn more about her and kind of how she came to be where she is, what she does for self-care and what it was like working in such a male dominated industry. So without further ado, let's dive in. Awesome. So how would you like to start? Um, I don't know. I guess, you know, hi, how are you? Um, <laughs> I always start with that. <laughs> Good. Or a random, a random question. Ooh, okay. Let's do that. That sounds fun. Okay. Uh, my random question today is, would you rather be a pizza tester and eat pizza all the time, never gain any weight as your mm. full-time job or a puppy photographer and take pictures of puppies all the time? Hmm. I think I would go with puppy photographer. I like it. Yeah. What about you? I, I always go back and forth. It really depends. Um, I think puppy photographer is just, I always get so giddy and happy with puppies Mm -hmm. and then pizza. I love pizza, but sometimes I feel yucky after I eat it. (laughs) Mm, That is fair. Me too. And I feel like there's only so much variety with pizza, whereas like with puppies, you have new people bringing puppies all the time for pictures. So there's like a huge social element there. Also, they're just like so stinking adorable. And I know my little ones are not going to be little forever and I'm going to have perpetual baby fever, but my partner's kind of at that point where he's not sure he wants more. And I was like, okay, well, I'll take it, you know, like pseudo through puppies. (laughs) Yes. Puppies are good. Like they give the ovaries a nice, like, oh, okay. Look puppies. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So how is, so tell, I want to know about social media and kind of what you do and all the stuff with your socials. Cause it's fascinating to me as someone, I hate social media. <laughs> like, I mean, hate is probably a strong word. I'm not very good at it cause I'm not consistent and I don't feel like I can keep up with it. And it really, to me, like my ego is like, it's because you're old and you're out of date and, you know, I should just stay on Facebook or whatever. You know, I joke, my mom is more social media literate than I am. I'm just not <laughs> Like, I'm not, so how did you get to where you are to be your entrepreneur self for a year now? Yeah. Uh, so it was kind of one of those coincidental entrepreneurial journeys. I just started it as like a hobby last year while I was on maternity leave. And then I found out I wasn't able to go back to my job. So I very quickly pivoted and it became like my full-time thing overnight when my mat leave was running out. Um, and I just, I kind of started social media I guess, coincidentally too. So I went to school for business and then being the youngest employee at a few different places that I worked at after they're just like, here you go. You're young. You get it. I was like, dude, like, I don't even have an Instagram profile. (laughs) Um, I was very much not one that was on social media. So I'm very self-taught, but my employers kept asking me to do this stuff. So I was like, well, I guess I better figure out how to do it. So I learned a lot that way. And then When I went on maternity leave with my first, uh, so she's turning four in September. So this was a little bit ago. I decided, you know, I wanted some human connection because she was born three months before the pandemic started. And then 
I was like, I am missing my family. Like I'm really big on family and I didn't, I didn't have anyone to talk to. My partner was working nights and sleeping all day. So it was rough. So I started blogging because I love to write and that was great. But then I very quickly realized that no one will read a blog they don't know exists. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That's so, a double-edged sword. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to have to like figure out how to promote myself on social media so that people will, you know, read my blog and then I can start having conversations and meet some really awesome humans. So I did that and I learned so much about social media. So I was talking with a friend looking for some volunteer work with my second pregnancy. So about a year and a half later. And she's like, you know, you're actually really good at this. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs in our, in our city that need help. And we don't have anyone that's local, you know, would you be interested in helping out with this? So I said, sure, why not? And it just, it's kind of gone from there. So it's been a, a very roller coaster journey, but I love it. And, uh, I like social media because it's, it's very community focused and different. So I feel like that's why you like many other people, feel like they struggle with social media or that they're not good at it. It's not because you're bad at it. It's just because they like to keep changing the rules and yes. <laughs> it's not fair to any of us, but <laughs> that is a really good point. I do. I struggle cause I need, I- I'm a rule follower after, you know, most of my life in a paramilitary organization, I'm just like, tell me what to do and I'll do it. And I need a schedule and a routine and consistency. So when I get, you know, like, okay, I, I need to do X, Y, and Z, however many times on these social media platforms. Mm-hmm. And you're right. Then the rules change. And it's like, nope, you need to do more of A, B, and C, a little less of Y, but maybe, you know, think of Z occasionally. And it's just, it is very mm-hmm. overwhelming, which is in a time, like, because it's always changing, it takes a lot of time. And I feel like for me, it just takes away from time of things that I want to be working on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I I get that a hundred percent, which is why I enjoy what I'm doing. If I can help provide some clarity for other entrepreneurs. Uh, So just a suggestion from me to you is focus less on what the algorithms are doing and focus more on how you can provide value for your audience and create content that they're going to want to engage with. So as someone who has a podcast, you're in a fantastic position to just be sharing more about your podcast. So I was actually sitting down and thinking through this the other day for myself and my podcast. And I have like a separate Instagram page for it that I want to do more with. But, you know, in a, in a realistic or an unrealistic world, I would like to, because I don't have time for this, but I would like to do like a bio of my guest on Monday. Tuesdays, my episode goes live. So I would do like a teaser of it. Wednesday, I probably wouldn't post. Thursday, I would probably do like my favorite quote from the episode. And Friday, I would post like the top three things that I found most interesting or relevant from the episode we talked about. So like that's for a relatively easy social media posts to make just to promote my podcast because it's content that I'm already creating and people are interested in it. They listen to my podcast. They follow me on social media. So that's something that you could look at doing too if you wanted. And then you know, throw in a couple sales posts. If you've got something that you're trying to promote to generate some income and you're good to go. Wow. Just like that. Thank you. Um, I feel like I just got a very great, um, social media tutorial. Yeah. (laughs) I think awesome. Most people just overthink it, I think is the really big thing. And they're like, I need to be like a multimedia production manager and put out like Hallmark movies. Every time I create a reel, I was like, No, like for the most part, yes, that will look good and you might get okay results with it. But the people that really, really like you and want to stick around don't care about the production quality. They just want to learn from you and they want to get to know you. That is a really good point. I I will be honest. I don't even know really how to do a reel. I my sister in law does them, and I see them, and like, so that's a whole separate sidebar conversation (laughs) that I need to figure out. But I'm like, I try to get the cool captions to pop up, and I don't even know how to do that. So it's it's very much learning. And I I guess for me, what I love about it is it it's pushing me beyond my boundaries and stretching Mm -hmm. me into a completely different you know world. And I think that really tests like my ability for leadership and just kind of like my capacity of learning something new and really pushes my boundaries. Um, (laughs) How do you, with two littles, I'm curious and entrepreneur, how do you find time for yourself? Um, That's a fabulous question. I actually have three littles. So my oldest will be, I still consider her little, but she'll be four. And then I have a two and a half year old. And then my son, Rhett is four months now. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So how do you take care of yourself? Like, how do you find time for you and running a business? And, you know, that's, that's, I'm exhausted just hearing three under four. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> It's a lot some days and some days it does not feel like I take care of myself or that I have good balance, but a lot of it is just being aware and I had to do a lot of rewriting for things that I was doing for myself. So I'm still kind of ramping back up after my pregnancy, but while I was even expecting still, I was still working out two or three days a week and I went from doing, oh, you know, like I have to work out to, you know what, I get to work out and I usually get to do it without my kids around and like that, that is self-care. And Mm -hmm. it took me a little while to realize that and kind of appreciate that. So those are one of, well, that's one of the big things that I do. And that's part of like my morning routine. So that is really huge for me. I try and look after myself first thing in the morning. So I do get up a little bit before my kids. So I have some quiet time, do some journaling, some reflecting, and then my workout. And then my partner watches them for a little bit before he goes to sleep in the morning. And then I try and take a little bit of time after the kids go to bed for myself. So sometimes it's like a shower (laughs) shouldn't be self-care, but you know, I take what I can get some days and other days, you know, it's like a date night or going out with friends. So it's, it's just making a conscious effort to keep myself on the list because I have gone through periods of time where I was like, you know what? No, I just need to put my head down and I need to hustle. And those times I feel like I was actually less productive than the times where I am looking after myself because my creativity was drained and it took me like two or three times longer to do something than if I had just taken the break and then come back to it an hour later. Oh, that is so profound. And I think it's really important to you know, realize that it's not always about what's on your schedule and how you manage your time. It's how you manage your energy. Mm-hmm. And there are just some times where, you know, you don't have the energy to do what is on your schedule and that is okay for all yep. the reasons you just said. I um I find now that I'm trying to figure out how to manage my time and all that I've been focused on sleep because mm-hmm. you know after 24 years of not getting great sleep I'm like I need a sleep routine. So that's my <laughs> foundation. And we've been getting up at like between 5:30 and 6 and same thing, going to work out, meditate, do mm-hmm. all my morning stuff. Yeah. And then by 8 30, 9 o'clock, I feel like, all right, I can tackle the day. Mm-hmm. But by two or three o'clock, I'm like, all right, that, I've hit my peak <laughs> and now I'm on the back hill slide of the of the curve. So I yeah. I don't do any huge brain tasking at that point. Mm-hmm. And it's hard. Like I feel a lot of, it's getting better, but like this guilt of, oh, am I doing enough? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I think, I mean, you're doing a lot better than a lot of people that you're aware of, you know, kind of those things, you know, I look after myself in the morning, then I have really good energy and I can really work through things. And then, you know, I kind of take the afternoons and evenings slower and hopefully to look after yourself more. And I feel like a lot of people just aren't I don't want to say aren't aware of that because I feel like somewhere they know that, but they're trying to fight against those natural instincts. And, you know, I was one of those people. I was like, doesn't matter what time of day it is or what my energy level is, I should be working because I need income for my family. And it takes a lot of time to kind of move past that. Uh, so good for you there. And also kudos for a sleep routine because I know, again, my productivity is like zero when I'm tired. <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, and I, I'm sure you're tired all the time. I, I, I'm in a different <laughs> yeah. phase of life. So, you know, thank God my son, he prefers to sleep really than do anything else right now at this phase in his life. So mm-hmm. it's, it's Good. a bittersweet transition because he doesn't need me as much and he wants mm. to play video games and everything else. But yeah, it's, and mm-hmm. I think that awareness is learning from, you know, being open and learning from other people and a little bit of, you know, being old, um, that the beauty of that and doing some work on myself, like, oh, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I talk to people about creating a self-care strategy and what works best for them, I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I have to follow my own advice or I'm kind of a hypocrite. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. I feel like that's huge for a lot of things. So I call that personal integrity and that's kind of, one of my, my key words or phrases that I set for myself at the beginning of the year is I want to be better at practicing what I preach. So, you know, as a, as a social media manager, I, I often do for my clients before I do for myself. So there'll be like two weeks where I don't post anything on social media. And, uh, sometimes I'm okay with that. Cause it's just the phase that I'm in, in my business. And other times I was like, you know what? No, like I really need to put my business first too, because 
it reflects on me and the potential people that are working for me. Like what kind of social media manager is she going to be if she can't, you know, even manage to make a social media post every two weeks. Uh, and I do a lot of email marketing in my business as well. So I really try and send my emails out regularly and create new lead magnets and, you know, get sequences in place to like welcome people to my list and all of those things, because I know that they're good for businesses, but you know, money sometimes comes first and your clients get put ahead of you. So I'm really trying to kind of work on fixing that paradigm. So it's a bit more of an even balance this year. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, I mean, good for you for recognizing that too, instead of, you know, I, I was given this really great, these great words of wisdom a couple months ago, and it was, don't set yourself on fire to keep other people warm. Mm. And like, that is just rattling around in my head so much because I feel like I've done that. You know, I'm like, give, 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 put Mm -hmm. everyone else first. And then, you know, like you just said, not bringing your authentic self or being worn out. And then now you can't do what you need to do to keep your business going. Have Mm -hmm. you found that the community that you've built, like, is that, does that fill that void that you were looking for during the pandemic? And when, you know, you started doing it as a hobby and do you still love doing the social media? Because a lot of times I think people think, oh, this is a great hobby. I'm going to make money out of it. And then they're like, oh man, I don't even like it anymore. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes. So (laughs) I started doing it so that I could promote my blog and then I got a bit of traction and I tried to like do the influencing thing for a while and have like people pay me to promote their products. And then I started to feel kind of icky about that because I didn't like that. I was constantly like more or less trend topping. Uh, so I stopped about the same time that I started working on my business. So there, are, there are times where I don't necessarily enjoy creating content for my own business. Cause it does feel a little bit more forced and scheduled and planned. Um, but my personal page, which is separate from my business page, I, I still like putting content up there. I just don't always have the time for it, but it's more like fun family stuff, things that I'm doing just in like general life and like workouts. I talk a lot about my health and my nutrition So it's very much like my personal page. And I still enjoy that aspect of it a lot, especially now that I kind of took out the, the demand feeling I had to continue growing and promoting other people's stuff. Now I literally just do it because I enjoy it. Oh, that's a good boundary that you've set. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Which again, I find that so interesting for you to say, because I feel like everyone I talk to is like, you need to set better boundaries. And then I talk to some people and they're like, wow, you're so good at it. So it it really all (laughs) just is about perception, I guess. I guess. Well, you know, boundaries is a, is a really popular word right now. I've heard Mm -hmm. it. I feel like a lot lately and talking about it. And I think it's as women, definitely it's something that we aren't given that, you know, that skill or even talked about, at least my mom never talked to me about setting boundaries because she Mm -hmm. was so busy, you know, doing everything for everyone else. I think, you know, she didn't like (laughs) recognize it. And especially as moms, as Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, as, you know, really industrious women that are not afraid to just keep going and going and going. Boundaries are a little weird. Um, (laughs) And I describe boundaries a lot of times as, you know, the ocean and the sand because Mm -hmm. they're fluid. And I Mm -hmm. think, you know, just like the moon controls the tide and sometimes the ocean comes further up, like those are boundaries. Sometimes your boundaries can be a little less you know, firm or a little more narrow. And then sometimes they're a little wider and, you know, they're fluid and depending Mm -hmm. on what's going on in life. And I think that makes it a little trickier because it's that gray area that really we Mm -hmm. all live in. And some people try to still live in a black and white world where, you know, it's very sequential and that's just not the way life works. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the best explanation I have ever heard about boundaries. And I love it because I, I really resonate with that. Yeah. There are certain times where I was like, okay, maybe my, my personal health, it sounds bad to say, but is less of a priority because, you know, I don't, I don't know how familiar you are with the Canadian financial landscape, but, uh, as of yesterday, they announced yet another mortgage rate increase. So Uh as a, a family on a variable rate, that you know, is a huge blow for us. Our mortgage payments doubled in the last 12 months. And, you know, as someone who left their job, assuming that my business would cover the expenses, that's been a very eye-opening experience. Wow. That's, that's scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Wow. <laughs> so I can, I can appreciate, I mean, the financial landscape mortgage crisis in the U S is slightly a mess too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for similar reasons, our rates keep going up, but mm-hmm. that would be a lot to, to challenge. That would be very challenging if my mortgage payment doubled mm-hmm. in a year. <laughs> So all the things, <laughs> oh man, like just a little more pressure. So yeah, it's that finding that balance of, uh, you know, taking care of yourself. And I always think about that too. It's, you know, balance is great. We always, you know, we talk about work-life balance and, you know, mm-hmm. I, and I don't believe in that. I believe that when you're at work, you should be at work and, you know, focused on work and it's not so much balancing it. It's about having a st- stable foundation so that, you know, it's not, not everything is burning at the same time. (laughs) You can, you can have like, if I, if I have a stable home life, I'm a lot more focused when I'm working on my work stuff and vice versa. If I have like, if I know I'm doing the best I can and, you know, producing and not, you know, sitting on the internet all day while I'm trying to (laughs) grow my business, then I feel better unplugging at night, you know? And I think a lot of times people misconstrue balance and stability, but you've got to be stable before you can be balanced. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. And just like they say, I always remember this back from like university Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So you say like the basic human needs is like food, shelter, and water. And then you kind of go into like relationship with yourself and then relationship with others. Um, and I feel like the majority of the population right now is struggling with the bottom tier of our pyramid yes. because it is such a crisis now with the rising cost of housing and there's like hardly places to rent either. It just in general, like food got more expensive. So even if you were stable, the shift in the landscape, like you said, in the last 12 months has caused a lot of people to get knocked back to the bottom rung of their ladder. So everyone's like, you know, why is the world unhappy and why are we overweight and X, Y, Z, I hear politics. I don't really follow politics, but I have heard a few politicians lately say those things. Um, and I was like, well, there's a really easy explanation for that. And it's because you more than ate through all of our disposable income. And now we are struggling to make ends meet. So yeah, of course, we're not really worried about you know, opening businesses and like traveling and doing all these things that support the economy because we can't even support our own families. Yeah, that's very profound. Very, I couldn't agree more. And I think we forget about that because, you know, you're trying to put food on the table and take care of yourself. And yet then the the unintended consequence, I think sometimes of social media can be, but everyone seems to be doing fine and it seems perfect out there. And you know, like what's wrong with me? And it becomes this like spiral of shame and doubt and, you know, lack and Mm -hmm. this, you know, mindset that becomes hard to get out of, which you need Mm -hmm. to get out of it. So you can provide food and I mean, it becomes this, you know, just a mess. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's super hard as an entrepreneur, especially because, you know, your business is your perception. And, you know, I'm not advocating that anyone should ever be fake or things like that online, but it's really hard because you want to show that your business is doing well and that you're getting good results for your clients and things like that so that more people work with you. But, you know, at the same time, sometimes behind the scenes, you're like, oh my goodness, like, what am I doing? Like, how am I going to make this work long-term? Because income is very fluctuating, at least for most entrepreneurs in their first three years of business, let's say. So Mm -hmm. it's a, it's kind of a balance of how can we be real and authentic online while still also doing well for our business and providing for our family? Yeah. So how do you do that? (laughs) That is a great (laughs) question. And I'm not sure that I have a perfect answer here, but I do try and talk a lot about kind of, you know, the struggles of entrepreneurship. And I probably don't talk about this as much as I would like to, but um, social media, again, hard to do for myself when I'm trying to do for others, but just kind of being aware, like, you know, yeah, like I can't get these great results for my clients, but you know, there's a limited amount of me to go around and I have to kind of, I don't want to say cut corners. I don't really know how to word this, but I just try and be authentic while still also promoting my business. And I feel like that's kind of why I have so many different social media accounts. So I have my personal account where I really talk more about the struggles of, you know, motherhood and being an entrepreneur and kind of those things. And then my business account where I'm talking a little bit more about business. So if people want to see what life for me is like behind the curtain, then they follow me on both accounts. And if they just want to learn how to grow their business, then they just stay kind of on my business profile. 
Mm-hmm. Right. I've, I've done that too. I have two separate profiles. Um, I had a really great profile and then I got locked out of it from oh, Instagram no. a couple of years ago. Cause my phone, it was, it was the whole thing, but I took that as an invitation to just start fresh um, yeah. <laughs> and build really, really slowly. But I do the same thing. I try to remember, you know, work is work. And I found that it takes a lot of stress and pressure off me. If I, you know, don't get so hung up on it, if I'm just posting to my personal page Mm -hmm. or personal sites, because, you know, I don't even think I posted, um, about my retirement to be quite honest on my main social media pages, just because I just, I didn't. And I guess that's the, it was more of a, I get to decide what I share and what I don't share. Yes. (laughs) And it doesn't have to be everything, let alone, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like no one needs, no one needs to know all the details. Some of it, I feel Mm -hmm. like it's almost like I've gone backwards of, no, I just want to keep some things personal for me. And maybe Mm -hmm. that's part of the entrepreneur journey of like, I don't want my whole world to be on display. And it was funny because I sent, I have a weekly email that I send out And last week I talked about how sleep has really kind of given me, it's restored my intimacy in my Mm -hmm. relationship a little bit. And my partner was like, "Uh, that's pretty public. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. (laughs) I mean, I didn't give any more details than that. Intimacy is a pretty like wide topic to talk about, but I do feel like I have to be aware of that now. Like, okay, my brand is me and my reputation and all that and what I share and don't share. And I don't know if people think a lot about that in the entrepreneurial journey. I don't think so. I feel, well, I feel like it's kind of one spectrum of the other. You either get the people that are totally open and will talk very actively about the details of that intimacy you were just talking about. And then you get people (laughs) on the other end and they're like, you know what, you know, like my life is my life and I don't want to talk about it on my business profiles. And I feel like there's few of us in the middle because it is such a gray area and we're like, well, what is appropriate to talk about as a personal brand? And you know, like what is too much and unrelated for those people that want to follow us for like entrepreneurial stuff. So it's, it's difficult, but I I was gonna say, I think that comes back to what we were talking about earlier with boundaries and, you know, the gray area. And there's times in our business where we are comfortable sharing more of our personal life. And then times where we want to just be more private. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And it also, what comes to my mind when you talk about that is it's a lot about, um, kind of that authenticity, right? Like it's, it's Mm -hmm. that gray area of, I profess authenticity. I think it's important to just be genuine and real. And I think sometimes you can confuse authenticity with oversharing Mm -hmm. and, you know, you can still be authentic and genuine and real and not share every finite detail you don't feel comfortable with because that's not authentic to you. Mm -hmm. And I also think about when I, it comes to that gray area, it's leadership too. And I always go back to that's how I led. That's how I lead is kind of a gray area because I care so much about the people and the things that I do when it involves what I'm in charge of, that that makes it really difficult and challenging sometimes to have hard conversations or, you know, I am like personally attached Mm -hmm. now. And now we have to have this really uncomfortable conversation and coming from a place of love and authenticity to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like the same can be said, even just in motherhood, there are a lot of times now that I'm kind of more aware of these things that I'm coming to the realization that my parenting style is very different. And that I'm really trying to break some of those generational habits and traditions. And it's having those hard conversations with my mom while, you know, still loving her, But it's like, we really need to talk about this because we're kind of, you know, blurring lines here and it's causing frustrations in our relationship. Mm, Yeah, that, that is really tough and very pro again, like I keep saying profound, but that's so wise of you. I mean, I know we talked about age a little earlier um, before we hit record, but Mm. that takes a lot of courage to do, to say, look, I love you and talk about a boundary. Um, And this is how Mm -hmm. I'm going to parent moving forward. And I've struggled a lot with the same, like I told my son a long time ago, and I don't even think he was probably sleeping in his crib. Like it stops here. I'm not passing a lot of this stuff on to you. I want to set you up for success. And that's Mm -hmm. so easy to say when they're asleep, snuggled up in the crib. Yet Mm -hmm. then when they're, you know, hormonally melting down and (laughs) having a moment and like automatically falling back to how, you know, what would have happened to me at that age in that moment. Mm -hmm. And we're like, no, take a deep breath. You can do this differently. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. So the the big thing for me right now in, you know, my relationship with my mom is all about self-care. So, you know, I was talking to her a week or so ago and I was like, you know what? I'm really burnt out at the time we were going away for the night because my friend was getting married and my partner was doing the photography. So we had a hotel room. He was like, you know, I'm just, I'm really excited to kind of have a night away from the kids. Like it's been a long time and I just kind of need to like regroup and like recenter. I need some self-care because I'm feeling burnt out. And she just kind of went on this rant about, you know, how our generation is so selfish that self-care is like not a thing. And, you know, we shouldn't need to do this. And we're just looking for an excuse not to parent our kids. And I was like, okay, I'm done with this conversation now because like, that's, I, I respect that that's your opinion, but I disagree. And I want to do things differently because, you know, I, I, don't remember a lot of being little. And I know that my mom loved me and she was always there, but as a mom now, I can imagine how draining and stressful that was. My dad traveled for construction all the time. And she was like literally looking after me and my brother by herself. Most of the time, I can't even imagine that. And I know that she obviously made it through it, but it had to have been difficult. And I want to do things differently so that, you know, any frustration that I might've seen and not remembered isn't, isn't there for my kids. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's really beautiful. And I, I remember having similar conversations with my mom and I've had her as a guest on my podcast a couple of times Aww. now because she just turned 80 and, you know, wow. her life has really changed since my dad passed away about three and a half years ago. And she really started to pick herself and she started to mm. choose herself and really care about her health and her longevity and just what she likes and what she wants. And mm -hmm. she's never done that before. So I feel like it's really come full circle that she is, you know, all about self-care and being selfish with her time and what she wants and drawing boundaries, which gives me hope because if she can figure it out at 80, I feel like, <laughs> all right, this is something that I can do. And, you know, I would offer to you as well, the same thing, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to say, like, it's not about you when it comes to our our parents and our moms and all that stuff. Cause it's their stuff. They need to work out. And mm -hmm. by saying, look, you work on you, you do you boo. I'm going to do me. And I'm going to try to change the cycle moving forward for my kiddos. And I think that's brave. I'd love for you to share some of your background. Cause I feel like we've talked about me quite a bit, but my listeners won't know anything about you by the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so I spent 24 years in the fire service, um, mm -hmm. grew up, my dad, even longer than that, really, because my dad was in the fire service my whole childhood. So there wasn't a moment in my life that I didn't, wasn't involved in the fire service. I was going to go away to do something different. And, mm -hmm. um, my grandma got sick and she really was pivotal in raising me because both of my parents worked and I didn't want to leave her. So I was like, oh, I'll just become a firefighter. And I did. And I had no idea. I was pretty naive when I got into it. You know, I thought it'd be really cool cool job. Um, and it was, it was a good job. And then as I kind of promoted up the ranks and became more in more leadership roles, I really saw the difference of, huh, it was 4% women, 96% men. So very male dominated. And I lost a lot of myself in the process, especially the first, I'd probably say the first 10 years, you know, I just wanted to fit in. I wanted to be liked. I, didn't make any, you know, female friends. I just really was heavy on the masculine energy because that's mm. what I was surrounded by. I had a lot of um, trauma from my childhood that I just didn't really ever process. And then a lot of trauma from the job that I was not prepared for to see so much hurt and suffering mm. and, you know, just all the things that when I really started to focus on leadership, um, I really you know, it was really hard to make that shift of, well, no, this is really who I am. This is what I like. And then I went through a pretty dark period where I just um, went through a really messy, high conflict divorce. And, you know, I left the organization where I spent almost 20 years at to go to a different fire department, which is really rare in the fire service. Usually you stay from the time you get hired. I mean, it's a 30 year career. No one leaves. No one, you know, you stay the oh. entire time. So to leave with almost 20 years in was pretty crazy. Um, and I went to a new department that was much smaller. Um, and it was really great. And a lot of 
fantastic opportunities. And then I still just had this feeling of, I want to do something different. I had started a blog in 2017, similar to you, but I had no idea how to promote it. And yeah. um, I just loved to write, like writing soothed my soul. And then I really found that I liked to speak and kind of talk about topics that weren't being talked about, whether it was ethics, equity, leadership, how to take care of yourself. And so I just like the universe kept giving me different breadcrumbs to follow that trail. And finally I was just, I made the intention. I talked about it for probably the last three or four years that, you know, if I leave, it's going to be for a laptop and an internet connection. I (laughs) thought I wanted to be a fire chief. And then I'm like, no, I don't want to be a fire chief. I really want to work for myself. I want that freedom. And I want to help the bigger collective. You know, I want to help people learn how to take care of themselves in a, in a way that works for them because there's not a one size fits all. It's really more of a framework and taking those concepts of, you know, building capacity in your life and what works for you. Cause it's very different. And then ultimately um, creating a community of women who are, you know, male work in male dominated professions and really need, need some of that feminine energy that's there. And, you know, I say it's kind of uh, it's buried, right? They need to fire, find the fire inside of them um, mm-hmm. to just find that, you know, place. And I think for me and being in a male dominated profession, I found that groups of women were intimidating and scary and like foreign mm-hmm. because there just wasn't a lot of women. And, yeah. you know, it was, I was always a tomboy and, you know, to be girly was like really a weird thing. And so to just embrace that femininity And I'm like, I'm sure I'm not the only one that works in a male dominated profession or that struggles with female relationships or, you know, wants more of that collaboration over competition. And so that's really what I'm off setting off to do now is create that community for women to do that. And just listening and um, the podcast has been a lot of fun to create that because I just talked to amazing women like yourself that, you know, offer inspiration and just different perspectives. And it's just been a lot of fun. So I've really found a lot more joy than I ever found working in the fire service. And that was a really good job. Um, just figuring out the other things. Wow. Well, congratulations <laughs> to you for starters, because we talked about this before we were recording, but you have actually left now and you are a full-time entrepreneur kind of doing your podcast and your blog, I assume. So good for yep. you for kind of taking that leap. That Thank is you. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is scary. And probably the definition of insanity of, you know, leaving a very secure, stable job in this, these financial times and, you know, it was a big leap of faith. Um, Mm -hmm. But so far, I love it. That's great. I am curious, though, because you said you kind of went through kind of almost a decade at the beginning of your career where you were kind of just so focused on fitting in. So what triggered you to kind of realize that it was time to change that paradigm and start looking after yourself? That is a wonderful question. Um, I think a few things happened. I was really struggling in my personal life. Um, I, I, I don't know the best way to describe it is there was just something inside me that felt off, mm-hmm. you know, and I had a conversation with my grandmother. She was almost a hundred at the time and she was a very tough woman. She was very hard. She had a hard life. And she said, she's like, I, I don't understand, you know, just be you be yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, you have a lot to offer this world. There's no competition. Just do your own thing. And I was like, wow, okay. Um, So I'm enough. And that's, you know, something that I just never really believed or even had the awareness of. And so when I started like, okay, I am enough. I can, you know, be more feminine at work, whatever that looks like in a very, you know, unflattering uniform kind of world. (laughs) And so I just trying to find different ways to express myself was kind of Mm -hmm. the beginning of it. And then I started to do the work on myself and really, you know, move some of those boulders and limiting beliefs that I'd had and, you know, healing a lot of the trauma that I've had throughout my life. And it just kind of, it was a slow, freaking messy, painful process that, you know, was really hard and still is at times, but that was kind of the triggering event. Like it was just kind of everything. And then when I went through the divorce, um, what I realized is it was really hard to go through a messy divorce in an organization that I grew up in. 
basically. Mm -hmm. So I'd been part of the organization since I was in my early 20s. And I worked really hard to have a good reputation. And I always kept my personal and professional life very separate. And then when my life imploded, it was no longer separate. And what hurt the most was people were saying things about me and believing things about me that I was like, you know me, you know, that's not true. No one cared what I had to say. So I just stopped because it, you know, it didn't matter. Don't let um, a story get in a good, don't let a good story get in the way. The truth is kind of what I, and I just was like, it doesn't matter. Like I'm trying to fit in to be part of this, these, this organization that doesn't care. So mm-hmm. I might as well just be me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm so sorry that you went through that, but you know, it seems like you were doing much better now. So I, I don't know how to say, it. <laughs> but like, I, I appreciate that you are seeing kind of the bright side of what was a very unfortunate situation. And then you're kind of in a better place now. Oh, absolutely. And you know, this has been years, so it's probably been the last eight years seven to eight years that really, so I can talk about it pretty easily now. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm grateful for it. I can look back and say, man, had that not happened, I wouldn't be where I am today. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the medicine in that was, you know, it's the universe gives you a whisper and then it gives you like a tap on the shoulder. And then (laughs) if you don't listen, sometimes it just cold cocks you right in across the face and, you know, takes you out. And that's kind of what happened, but I'm grateful for it now. Good. Well, hopefully you've, you've learned all the lessons the universe has to give you and you can just kind of enjoy it for a while. I I feel like, yes. And then something will happen. I'm like, okay, we're still not done yet. Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) It's that I always tell that to my therapist. I'm like, God damn it. Can we just stop? Can I just have like a pass for a little bit? And he's like, no, it's really not how life works. But yes, to your point, I feel like maybe some of them are just little bumps, not like huge ravines that I have to cross over. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Mm-hmm. So being in such a male dominated industry, how different is it for you now being a solopreneur? Cause you are very much on your own. You get to be you. Is it bad if I say you look very feminine today? <laughs> no, not at all. Thank okay. you. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's been, um, it's been great. You know, the first thing I did after I retired, of. Uh, I got my nose pierced. Um, so, you know, like I, I'm like nurturing the inner child in me and just really finding what I feel comfortable doing and who I am becoming. And it's, it's always, you know, evolving and it's just been really fun to just be like, no, I can, I can wear my hair down or I can put makeup. And I did put earrings on today. Cause I feel very, you know, <laughs> you I nice. didn't know if we'd be on video. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But, you know, so I'm finding, and then there are some days where I'm like, I'm not getting out of my pajamas and that's Mm -hmm. okay too. Instead of this, you know, impossible standard of, I have to look this certain way or be this certain way. Now I'm just kind of whatever I feel like in the morning when I wake up. Mm -hmm. And it's very empowering to have that choice. Whereas before you would go to work and you had a very, I imagine very strict uniform about what you had to wear, even when you were not out in the fire truck, right? Yep. It was navy blue pants, navy blue t-shirt, a bad shirt if I was in public. And, you know, towards the end, it was awful. I would wear, you know, I'd wear silly socks because that was kind of a way to express myself or I'd wear silly mm-hmm. underwear, but that's a whole different, you know, <laughs> one <laughs> sees like, that. <laughs> exactly. No one sees that. But it made me feel good about myself because I'm like, ah, I've yeah. got funny underwear on, whatever. But um, so yeah, it was really hard to be an individual. And I think I've just, you know, so it, it was always inside of me and expressing myself has been a lot easier in the last four weeks than in the last 24 years for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I bet. Uh, now tell me a little bit more about your podcast, which is yet another form of self-expression that you've stepped into. Yes. So, um, I started the fire inside her podcast in February and it really is about, um, it's, you know, as you know, only 27% of podcasts are hosted by women. So again, we are, the odds are stacked against us again. So Mm -hmm. it was, you know, bringing that voice, um, into a very noisy male dominated world of hearing stories about women who are, who are on their journey to authenticity and how, you know, through leadership and self-care and community, they've kind of, you know, they share who they are and 
some of the decisions they've made. And um, it's been so much fun to do it because to meet people like yourself and Mm -hmm. just, you know, expand my circle has been amazing and just really, really fun to do. I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I remember when we were first chatting, I was like, man, I really like the name of your podcast. That's so cool. And it's so very fitting since you come from a background in the fire industry. Mm -hmm. I came up with that name, um, almost 10 years ago now and I got the domain and I was like the fire insider. I love that. I love that. So it, it's Mm -hmm. been nice to, you know, that's what I named a Ted talk. It's, you know, the, I'm not sure the community, I feel like the community that I'm creating, I haven't decided on a name for that yet. Um, but it probably won't be the fire insider. It might be something about the kitchen table. Um, so yeah, just, you know, it's finding that fire inside of you. It just seems to be a constant in my life that I can fall back on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so cool. And it's kind of that piece of your identity that you still bring with you, even though you're kind of still evolving. Yes. Well, and we're always still evolving, right? We should be, we shouldn't Mm -hmm. be the same person, you know, as we were 20 years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago, we should be changing and growing. And I think learning that is then really a powerful tool or a powerful pill to take like, Oh, I don't have to be the same person I was last year. I can keep changing and growing. Awesome. (laughs) And the people who don't like it or who aren't comfortable, that's on them. That's their, yes, that's their journey, not yours. Um, Mm -hmm. so yes, thank you for asking. Tell me a little bit more about your podcast. Mm, uh, So it's called, uh, go get great with Brittany Miller socials. So it's kind of, it's very me. It's a mix of business. So I do some like soul episodes where I'm like, here are the social media platforms you need to use. And then I do a lot of episodes like this, where I'm connecting with other women and entrepreneurs. And, you know, we're sharing stories and things that we've learned in life and in business and kind of talking about how we can kind of make them all work together. Because I feel like that's the biggest struggle for all of us, uh, just figuring out how we do this. Cause there are so many expectations about, you know, you have to be a mom full time, but you also have to work full time and support your family. And, you know, when you have to do both, then h- how do you do it? Because there are a fixed number of hours in the day, no matter how much we wish there weren't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, I love that idea. And I appreciate the conversation because it's very real and there's no one size fits all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, everyone's different. So how do you make life and business work together? I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I, I, uh, well, the first thing is giving myself a lot of grace. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, that I am not going to get it right all the time. And right now I consider it a win if I get it right a fraction of the time. Um, but I just try to, I look ahead at my schedule and I try to prioritize, you know, what it looks like based on getting, taking care of myself first thing in the morning Mm -hmm. and, um, getting those needs met and just looking at my parenting time with my son. And so really trying to front load a couple of those days, Mm -hmm. while honoring my energy and then being open and just continuing to do what I love and being open to invitations as they, you know, come and sticking Mm -hmm. my neck out there. Um, and I'm so grateful to have an amazing supportive partner who just is very, um, he believes in me and it's really nice to have someone else to believe in myself besides myself, you know, Mm -hmm. to be like, Hey, yeah, you're doing okay. Um, (laughs) you know, like no pressure and really just trying to figure it out. I think grace is the biggest thing I'm doing learning right now is that, Mm -hmm. you know, I just, I know that this is a priority and I need to, you know, do this. And also just from studying and taking classes and all the things, I also want to do it right from the beginning, like as far (laughs) as foundationally, not necessarily success wise, but like if I can create a schedule now that, you know, to be in the lifestyle I want three years from now, but if I can Mm -hmm. act and function that way now, I'm, in my logic brain, I'm like, okay, then I build that system now instead of waiting for three years to try to pivot and change it. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what? That is sage advice. Let me tell you, because when you first start a business, you like go hardcore 24 seven all the time. It is all you do because you feel like that's what you're supposed to. But then eventually you realize you've now taken on so much that in order to keep that capacity, you have to keep those hours, which is the exact opposite reason why anyone starts a business. So that's kind of where I'm at in mine right now. Like I, I need to keep going. I need to make money, but also I'm not willing to sacrifice another year of my life still working 24 seven. Then they're done that. And you know, it's not working. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I see that with people and I, you know, hear that from courses and, you know, everything else and mm-hmm. trying to find that balance because it's so alluring to be like, oh, but I can just do this. Like this time doesn't work for you. How about we, re- we record at nine o'clock at night, you know, like, mm-hmm. and just not doing that and, and being okay with like, that person, it, it's just not a good time right now. And the, it, it's not going to work out, you know, for example, like us, right? Like we were supposed to record this a yep. couple months ago <laughs> and then life happened and everything else. And yet now here we are. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's having faith in the universe with that has been really another hard thing to learn, but it mm-hmm. seems to be working. Like it, yeah. I was stressed out about getting guests for my season three podcast. I was like, Oh no, I, I, how am I going to find guests? And, and sure enough, like now I'm getting people requesting like, Hey, I'd like to be a guest on your podcast. So I, you know, it, it does work out. Mm-hmm. And I believe that the universe conspires to help you if you let it. Nice. That's good. I, I agree. I'm also still learning to trust the universe. It's hard when you need money in the bank account and the universe doesn't always do money. <laughs> Right. Right. Yes. Yes. And, you know, and and I can say, I can talk a good game now because I've prepared for this before I left Mm. my job and, you know, six months from now, I might be in a very different space. (laughs) So I will have to re-listen to this and be like, oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) Just calm down. It'll all work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. So one of the other questions that I really like asking my guests, if you're open to it is what is one of the big, um, failures that you've had and what have you learned from it since? Because I'm trying to learn even for myself to reframe failure as a stepping stone towards what we're working towards instead of, you know, when I was younger, failure felt like the be all and end all. Mm -hmm. That is a really powerful question. The first thing that comes to mind, and this is what I have to remind myself and I tell my son all the time is people are not failures, you know? So it's first of all, separating the incident that happened that didn't go as planned Mm -hmm. That's the failure. I am not a failure. You are not a failure. My son is not a failure. What happened was the failure. So I think really processing that and realizing that I'm not a failure when things go wrong um, is the first part of the answer. And oh God, just one. I feel like there's so (laughs) many um, to choose from. I can like spin a wheel. (laughs) Um, I think... Probably one of the biggest failures um, that totally changed the trajectory of my life was not getting a promotion um, oh. in my one of my organizations that I worked for, my first organization. I had tried several times to promote to a different spot. And, you know, there are a lot of reasons that it didn't happen. And I, you know, I tried three times. Oh. And the last time um, I was, you know, I had all the right education. I had, you know, I had checked all the boxes and there weren't a lot of people competing for the one spot. So the standards were lowered and they got rid of an education requirement and stuff like that. So I was already in this victim mindset, like, this is not right. It's not fair. And then there were some other, like one of the um, people that were evaluating shouldn't have been in the room. And I had made that to the chief. I was like, I don't think this is really, you know, fair to put this person in the room with me because of events that were going on. And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. It's not going to impact your chance of getting promoted long story longer, I didn't get promoted. I was not selected. And I was like crushed because, you know, I'm like, what did I do wrong? I've done everything right. You know, me, 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 poor me, poor me. And then finally I was like, you know what? I've got options and I can leave. And I never, you know, so it really, it was that moment. And it was probably six months before I actually left the organization, Mm -hmm. but it just changed my mindset. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it, gave me the courage to leap to a different organization. And then building on that gave me the courage to leave again after four and a half years to not go anywhere else, but to, to pick me. So I think that was probably a really defining moment in the last several years. Wow. Good for you. Again, unfortunate circumstances, but good for you. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it was really messy and it was really hard and it was really, you know, emotional and sad and, you know, all the feels for it. Um, but, you know, it was a huge boundary that I, I picked me and it's worked out pretty good. Good. Yes, good. Thank you I'm for glad. asking that. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm, I'm trying to think. I don't have um, a hard, hard question like that. <laughs> okay. But my question to you would be, if you could um, give one or two pieces of advice on how choosing yourself first has, and I know we've talked a lot about this, but how choosing mm-hmm. yourself has really um, created a foundational change in who you are and how you come to the world. What would the, what would that be? Like, what advice would you give to that? Like why it's not selfish to take care of yourself? Mm-hmm. So really, really good question. Um, I have to give a little bit of background info to answer this. So my partner, Grayson and I got together um, probably a little over five years ago. So we were together for a while. It was like a whirlwind. We got a house probably a little sooner than we should have did a lot of renovations, got pregnant with our first child unexpectedly COVID hit. And like, things were hard. Things were hard. Uh, his work shifted him from like a straight days position to an overnight position. Cause he took time off. Uh, cause I was, you know, I had all the COVID symptoms. Turns out I was expecting our second, but we didn't know that for <laughs> two weeks until the test came back positive, uh, the pregnancy test, not the COVID test. Um, and it just, it caused a lot of issues in our relationship and we were really struggling. And I was like, you know what, we need to go to therapy. We need help. We're, we're not communicating well. And, you know, we're just beating the same bush and we need to stop. And, uh, he didn't. And eventually I was tired of asking. And I said, this is the ultimatum. We do this or we're done. And he was like, all right, okay. So then, you know, we separated and lived with my parents for a while. And then I needed out of my mom's house. I love her, but we butt heads. Mm -hmm. So we purchased a house together, which in the world of normal is not normal. Like you don't buy a house with your ex. And then, you know, we were living together. He was in the basement and I was upstairs. And then I decided I wanted another child and my attempts at dating in the middle of a pandemic while we weren't together, were not going well. So I was like, you know what? If I'm going to have another child, I'd rather it be with the same one as my last two parent wise. It makes life easier. So will you help me? So we did. And I did that. And that was very unusual. Um, but kind of the long story short for this is, is that we're actually back together now. So I'm really glad that I listened to my own instincts about what was good for me and my family and not have some random stranger in the basement, because if he wasn't here and around and supporting me throughout a very difficult time, um, financially for us, as I switched to this new career and leaving my other job and just like COVID ongoing COVID in general, you know, we would not be back together and very happy right now because I probably wouldn't have bought a house with them. And we would have had so much distance between us that there would never have been an opportunity to reconcile. Mm -hmm. So really just kind of doing what I knew was best for me and ignoring everybody else has had such a wonderful impact for myself and my happiness. And also for my family, like my kids got their dad back, which not many people can say. That's, oh, wow. That's a very vulnerable and creative, <laughs> courageous story to sell, to tell. So thank you for that. That's mm-hmm. awesome. And I can tell you seem very happy. Like, you know, I, just, I, <laughs> yeah. can, you, I can see your smile and, and, you know, it's, it, you took care of what's important to you. And mm-hmm. I love that. I think that's awesome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Did you want to ask anything else before we wrap up? I feel like we've been talking for a while. This could be a long episode. Yeah. <laughs> I know. No, I feel like I'm good. What- So thank you so much for joining me today, Diane. It was fabulous speaking with you and learning more about your journey and your self-care practices. It was just a fantastic opportunity to share so much knowledge and wisdom with my audience. So I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for your time. All right. We will see you all next week. Thank you so much for tuning in to Go Get Great. I hope you found some useful tips and tricks that can help you make life and business work together. If what I said resonates with you, please share it on social media and don't forget to tag at Brittany Miller's socials so that I can celebrate you for taking those first steps towards achieving greatness. Remember, success doesn't happen overnight. It takes dedication, hard work, and a lot of spirit. So don't be afraid to dream big and go after what you want. Keep striving for greatness. You get closer with every step forward, no matter how small they may seem. Until next time, go get great.